All right, everybody. Thank you for attending the spring semester of Coilog EDU. We're going to be talking about metal alloys and magnetic fields today. So brush off that high school diploma because uh, we're about to enter an AP physics class that I sure as hell didn't fucking take. So don't uh, listen to me about anything, but also listen to me because I have a lot of uh, points that I, I want to talk about. It's my very important Elden Ring opinion time. And you have subscribed to this, so welcome. Cool. We're not going to be talking about the chronological order or the like concrete happenings in the game. I'm actually going to make a video about that later. Me and Hazel are working on this really awesome timeline that has all these item descriptions that support when certain events happen in the game um, and when, uh, you know, certain countries invade other countries and the relationships between people who breaks up with who we got the whole tea it's gonna be great i'm gonna make a video about it but for now i'm gonna be in my little conspiracy corner talking to you guys about the symbols that's used for the storytelling and what i feel like they might mean um super important because miyazaki likes to use complex metaphor to establish the relationship between characters or factions um so example like an example of that would be um how uh you know, Godfrey, who is like of the golden age, becomes tarnished. Gold that's mixed with other alloys has a higher rate of tarnishing. And then Michaela is trying to become the unalloyed. Whoa, <laughs> a gold that doesn't tarnish. So we're going to be talking about what that all might mean, um, what that might be representative of, and some of the hints and breadcrumbs that Miyazaki has left us in, in, the, in the item descriptions and the story that help support um, and like explain some of these relationships and symbols so let's let's get into it um before i get super deep into like the gold copper silver thing i really want to talk about miyazaki himself um because understanding him a little bit is going to be really integral to understanding how he tells his stories so um he grew up in a household that didn't allow video games he actually didn't own his own consoles and games until he was in college um but he loved board games and fantasy growing up he really loved the board game sorcery um believe it's a board game but i know for a fact that he also really loves magic the gathering apparently the from software headquarters has like stacks of magic the gathering cards everywhere that's pretty cool um but when he was growing up he was a really big fan of uh mythology and books and he would oftentimes read books that were above his reading level um and he talked in this interview about how um there is this gap of uh knowledge or information where you would kind of use your imagination to ascertain the point of the story. Um, and I actually relate to this quite a bit because I read a lot of myths growing up that wasn't that they were necessarily above my reading level, but I think that the symbols and the the word usage was so different than normal storybooks or, or children's books that it was very hard for me to understand why things played out the way that they did. Um, but Miyazaki really wanted to bring that kind of experience to video games. Um, where you use your imagination to complete the missing parts. Although I don't think that he's telling us that we need to interpret things out of thin air, I think that he's actually being very modest in this interview because he does a really good job at leaving us a breadcrumb trail to follow to understand what his points are. He also likes to use the same symbols across all of his games. So if you've played more than one game, if you played more than just Elden Ring, there's not necessarily a chronological story that you do need to worry about at all, but the thing that you do kind of need to worry about if you haven't played the other games is that there are repeating symbols that he uses across all of his games that kind of help us understand the thing that he's trying to say with like some of his metaphors and symbols. Um, an example of this, one of my favorites, is the Scepter of the All-Knowing. It's a hand that's grasping a pearl. And these are actually two items that have appeared in, or two objects, concepts that have, have appeared in multiple games of his. He likes to draw, or draw, he likes to uh, make bosses that have swollen hands that are trying to always be grabbing at things. Um, so in Dark Souls 1, there was Manus, who was like grabbing after his pendant. Um, in obviously like Artorius has a busted arm. In Sekiro, there's uh, the main characters missing an arm, but there's also the sculptor who, when he goes insane, he grows a big arm of fire. There's this idea of like, you know, arms being being taken away or like growing to like really weird, um, large, grotesque sizes, grasping for things that they can't have. But um, there's also the, this pearl, which stands for the world, 
the heavens, and an eye, representing the many forms of knowledge that are never fully attainable. And this is a really interesting complex metaphor that he uses across all of his games, and he it can get really complicated because, um, you know, there's layers going on here. There's the world, the heavens, and an eye, and a pearl. So anytime that you see these items in the game, you're like, is that, does this represent cosmic knowledge that's never fully attainable? Um, in Bloodborne, he uses this with the insight system. So there's a system in the game where you collect eyeballs, and the more eyeballs that you get, the uh, more insight you have to be able to see, like visually perceive and see the cosmic outer gods that are like in the setting. So we're able to see amygdala, we're able to see other things that we wouldn't normally be able to see. Um, the pearl, the world, the heavens, and an eye, it represents the same thing. It represents insight or cosmic knowledge. Um, it's this question, so it's like, um, it's never fully attainable. It's this question of things like, you know, where do I go when I die? Is God real? Like, there's there's all these questions that we'll never be able to fully attain as mortals. But even knowing that, we still desire to, to understand it. We still desire to grasp for it. And this concept is something that's present in, like, almost all of his games. So the fact that he literally puts it in the game as an item to be like, hey guys, remember <laughs> remember what I'm trying to say? Um, is really neat. And he does this a lot. There's also more than just um, the pearl, the world, the heavens, and an eye. There's also sunflowers, which represent eyes. There's objects in the game that constantly are looking like eyes. There's shields, armor, helmet pieces that look like eyeballs. Um, there's there's a lot of stuff that he puts in the game to resemble this like pursuit of knowledge um, that mortals tend to have. But the god or like the deities in the world, <clears throat> their concerns are a little bit different than the mortals. The mortals are constantly kind of grasping for this knowledge, but um, the the deities or like the godlike people are actually oftentimes fearing for their age um, to come to an end or for their age to stagnate, uh, stagnate or they're scared of death. They're scared of like all of their things ending. Um, and so we see Queen Marika and Elden Ring um, you know, when we we're first introduced to the world, we we're introduced to this concept of bird tree barrel, burials. And so initially I thought, oh, this is the life and death cycle that's in all of Miyazaki's games. But I was wrong. I was wrong because we find out later that Queen Marika actually sealed away the god of death, who's known as the Glomide Queen. And she replaced the death system, which was uh, managed by creatures called the death rite birds. She replaced that system with her Erd tree burials um, instead. So the life death cycle is actually false in this game. It's not the original one that was created. Um, and something that you learn from Melina is that um, Marika says, I declare mine intent to search the depths of the Golden Order. Through understanding of the proper way, our faith, our grace is increased. Those blissful days of early blind belief are long past. My comrades, why must ye falter? And this statement is informs us a lot about Marika's attitude attitude towards like the overall balance, the cycle of life and death, and all these different aspects of life. She's very, very concerned about controlling or manipulating it or increasing her faith and her reason of being. Um, she's very concerned with this. And something that we find out, like I mentioned before, super early on, um, is that she seals away death. And I'm actually going to talk about this super quick. So I came across Radon's um, Gravity sigil, it's actually the Onyx Lords that are like aliens. They're a uh, sigil for gravity, but the interesting thing is this isn't actually a sigil for gravity. This is actually a chart for a magnetic current or magnetic field, like a planetary magnetic field, which is interesting because magnetism and gravity are actually very different um, and their, their diagrams look quite different. So um, gravity is the point if something has great enough mass um, things will be drawn to it, and so the uh, the diagram for it would look a little bit more like this, where you just have a singular object and things are coming to it. But in this one, we see these, like, we see a North Pole and we see a South Pole and we see all these different rings happening. So for those of you that aren't familiar with magnetic fields, um, it is effectively the field that the Earth is, or like any planet really, asteroids um, have them too. Anything that has enough um, magnetic energy or like metals within the uh the objects like crust or 
the way that it's like composed. Um, if it if it has enough of a magnetic charge, it'll create a magnetic field for itself. Um, the strongest points of the magnetic field are the North Pole and the South Pole. Um, and then all of the other points are trying to converge onto themselves. Um, so that's what these lines are depicting. So it's this like natural flow of like the North Pole trying to like connect to this South Pole. There's like this natural draw um, between these two points. Um, and this creates a magnetic field. So why the fuck is, is this important? Well, something I noticed while looking at this magnetic field chart is that the Glomide Queen and Queen Marika are actually depicted in this little, in the, in a magnetic field chart, which is super cool because they are technically, uh, twin signs. They're opposite twin signs. So the Glomide Queen's rune is the rune of death. So this is her rune. It is a crucifix with like this downward arc. And then Marika's is this crucifix with this upward arc. I'm actually gonna do this in red because I'm I'm a professor. I'm a professor and this is my classroom and I have to be organized. So um, it's really cool that this is like depicted and it's also their specific runes that would be present within the Elden Ring sigil. Um, so I was like, oh neat, cool, little like opposing like these are opposing magnetic poles right like one could be positive and one could be negative or whatever um you know it's these are these are opposites these are the opposites that are eternally yearning to converge and something that we learn about the golden order is that the two fundamental laws of the golden order is the laws of causality and regression that all things yearn to eternally converge um uh and the relationships between one another so it's really interesting that they take the Golden Order's like primary principles and they apply it to this this idea of balance um, and this idea of conflict um, between two opposing opposites. So something else that's really interesting is when we fight the fire giant, the fire giant is um, in his second phase. He is possessed by the, the God of Flame. We know him as the Fell God. Um, but the god of flame is the god of the fire giants and it has the ability to enter the fire giants bodies so the fire giants are all natively what's called empyreans they're all able to house their god inside of them but their god is actually able to enact their will and move through their body and this is kind of what separates the um bloodborne outer gods from the elden ring outer gods the bloodborne outer gods are they can appear within um, the hunter's dream we can see them in our dream if we have enough insight but the outer gods are very very far removed from the physical world and they actually need to be um need to uh enact their will or like house themselves inside of a vassal um they need a physical conduit to be able to enact their will and it's really interesting that we're talking about magnetic poles and all this other stuff because once we get into metal and magnetism we're actually going to find out that metal works as a conduit for energy um and i believe that that's what miyazaki's trying to use as symbols we'll get to it but anyway um this is the i believe this is yeah this is the north pole of jupiter um so we added a sixth Okay, yeah, yeah. So the South Pole of Jupiter has six cyclones, but um, the North Pole recently got eight. There's eight circles, eight cyclones happening with one in the center. And the way that this structure is able to be maintained is that all of these are um, serving as opposites to each other. They all balance each other out and they all are moving towards this center pole. They're like um, drawn to this like magnetic force into the center of this cyclone but then the center cyclone repels them and they're constantly being pulled towards each other so the center one kind of keeps them in check and it it maintains this really unique structure because of the relationship between these magnetic fields and these poles and it's it's a very beautiful picture that we see here and i believe that this is the structure of the um celestial bo bodies or like the outer gods or the the great runes is that they all counterbalanced each other they all had twin runes just like marika and the glomide queen they all complemented each other perfectly and balanced each other out but then as soon as you start sealing away certain gods so say for example marika sealed away the glomide queen 
the structure let me use a white one the structure of this like beautiful cyclone is going to become counterbalanced so for example say you sealed away the glow glomide queen well this cyclone is going to start to be able to um or it's not going to be pulled to the opposite one but then you know it might get destroyed like the the fabric of it might get dissolved because the cyclone in the center is probably going to like push it away um and it'll probably just go over here somewhere actually i don't know why i drew the arrow the other way so yeah that that kind of fucks up the whole structure of things right um and i think it's really interesting that we have this uh you know this like cause and effect going on between um electron or magnetic charges electric charges um and that the will of god moves through us through uh, like we act as a conduit for the will of God and it gets it gets kind of complicated There's actually like whole science behind um, Magnetic forces and conduits and stuff, but I don't I'm not I don't fucking have a degree in this shit So I don't know what I'm talking about half the time um, but uh, what I do know is uh, high school level um, Chemistry and <laughs> we can talk about that instead So there's this common theme of gold silver and copper that's used frequently throughout the game obviously Marika and her golden age is is the golden order they're represented by gold um the albinorix the people that live in noxtella and anybody that worships the moon is resembled or like represented by silver and copper is the eocade i don't know if i'm pronouncing that name right i'm going to call them the elmers because elmer or maybe the briar i'll say the briar the briar are represented through copper um and i'll get into them too as to why they're important there's only one npc from the briar that we actually even like C, um, and it's Elmer. Um, so at first I was like, oh, they're probably not important, but Elmer actually illustrates a really important um, relationship. So even though there's only one of him and he's not integral to the story, he kind of shows us how Will is um, related to magnetic force. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But um, these three metals are called the coin metals and they are group 11 on the periodic table. They all group they're all related to each other. They all group together and they're, they all naturally occur in nature and they're really excellent, excellent, <laughs> excellent conductors. Um, silver is actually the best conductor um, of the three, but it tarnishes very easily. Pure gold doesn't tarnish, which is why it's so valuable because you can continue to use it long after time has passed. I don't it, like it doesn't. It's very rare that it gets tarnished. Um, and it's it's just very valuable in that sense but if you mix it with other alloys um like if you try to make it more conductive uh by like mixing it with silver um then you might run the risk of that gold tarnishing and something that's really interesting is marika is trying to increase her faith she's trying to increase her like her golden powers her golden like connection or conduit her she wants to be the best conduit for god she wants to have god's um you know whole thing moving through her um so yeah like that that's kind of That's kind of like if we look back on on this part where she says uh, through understanding the proper way our faith our grace is increased so I believe that she's mixing metals in order to find the best way to like channel her will of God and um, we actually see her uh, suppress other types of, of belief systems and other types of gods she's really dedicated to uh, kind of like suppressing anybody that could oppose her or her will um so she gets rid of death obviously and i believe that her motivation for sealing away death is because after a while the earth tree is so the earth tree is born from this like thing called the crucible and i'll get into what that means later but it's it's born from the great tree it's a different tree and the great tree or the crucible i like to see as like godfrey's um symbol of his like age he establishes the crucible knights um 
the crucible represents this like barbaric warrior age this like age of natural order this this very like um you know like the misbegotten look like look like a uh, manticores like they have very animalistic features um and they used to be deemed as like divine but as society advances and we move away from nature we deem them as like barbaric um we enslave them there's like this weird sense of superiority the further away from nature that we that we move away from um but marika likes to do this by actually like she like colonizes areas and then she'll assimilate belief systems or cultures into her own and then she'll use them as slaves an example of this is the fire giants she enslaves the fire giants um they turn into trolls and they then work as um carriage carriers like they'll pull the carriages or they'll uh, go work in the mines um we also see this with the invasion of lyrnia um she sends radagon over to disrupt everything that's going on over there um and sure enough there's some silver stuff that's been happening happening in Lyernia. um so she seems to be threatened by by anything that isn't this like this gold but it seems that the more sins or atrocities that she commits um the more her age begins to tarnish um the more of the balance she fucks up the balance of her own age gets fucked up um and then finally it's when godfrey slays the lord of the giants the storm lord that he loses the grace in his eyes and the greater will no longer wants to um and like send their will through the tarnished warriors um they lose their luster they're no longer a desirable metal anymore and mckella realizes this um because mckella's sister and him are both cursed um, he doesn't believe that the Golden Order is going to be able to save him or his sister, and I believe he's also seeing, you know, he was born after Godfrey's era, so he's seen the Tarnished, he's seen, you know, all this stuff that's been happening. And so he actually sets out to figure out ways that we can um, disrupt this connection of God's will um, or God's influence through us. And he finds a way to do that through these needles. Um, another tool that we see um, used to disrupt this energetic flow or this like flow of god-like electricity is a uh, crystal so they're called mirhams but they're made out of crystal looking glasses um, and it turns out crystals have the ability to transform or absorb absorb uh electric charges so if you like charge them with electricity they'll start to vibrate but they hold the electricity within themselves so say for example if you're wearing a mirror helm and the influence of god <laughs> strikes you like a bolt of lightning um it would get stored in the crystals not in you um and i believe that that's the purpose for these things as far as michaela's needle goes i actually think michaela's needle is akin to mercury um at first i thought the silver tears were when i first saw the silver tears i was like "Ooh, these look like mercury but it's kind of like re-established over and over and over again in the items that um, the Mimics and the Albanorics are created from silver. And silvers are really, silver, like I mentioned before, is a really strong conductor. And that's why, you know, like you'll see the uh, silver tears in Nox just like explode with electricity. They have this ability to um, send electricity through them, but they're short-lived, they tarnish e easily, so they're not necessarily as desirable as gold. Um, but, like I mentioned before, the people of Noxella were able to figure out how to store this electrical, electrical charge in crystals to prevent the, uh, the spread of God through their people. Um, and they also developed, like, the Finger Slayer Blades. Like, they were pretty set on creating their own way. They don't, they don't want the interference from outer gods. Um, but Michaela's Needle, like I was mentioning, reminds me of Mercury because Mercury can actually be used to pull alloys out of um, out of other alloys, if that makes sense. So you can remove gold from other things. Um, and, um, sorry, there's some stuff going on. So I believe that this is kind of like what, what um, Michaela's Needle is supposed to represent. There's unalloyed gold, which is um, this pure gold that doesn't have any other alloys that's mixed in with it. And this gold does not tarnish. This gold is, it's good to go forever. Um, in order to achieve that, people have to be reborn um, because they were mixed with other things. So Albanorics are mixed with silver. Um, Misbegotten are mixed with the Crucible, which 
I personally think is supposed to be copper because the uh, Crucible Knights got that red armor. Ooh, copper. Um, so they wish to be unmixed or unborn with these other alloys. They want to be pure gold, so then that way they don't tarnish or they don't lose their luster. Um, and I feel like by understanding how we can remove the influence of God, it gives us a greater understanding of this like energy flow and these conductors and these these conduits that are humans, are mortals. Um, we act as conductors for the gods. Um, but something really like interesting about Elmer and his group is that, that I was kind of looking into. First off, let me rewind. We were talking about magnetic fields earlier. So silver and gold are both magnetic. Um, they're both drawn to things. They're drawn by the pull of opposites. However, copper does not have this same magnetic property in this in the same way. Um, there's actually been instances where I've seen copper repulse magnets, but for the most part, it, it has a very weak magnetic pull. Um, but I thought that that was really cool because Elmer is able to throw his sword out and then like pull it back as if it's attached to him through a magnet. But if you actually read about his sword, it says um, the copper coloration is not to be confused for rust. It's a conduit for its wielder to move it by their will alone. Which makes me think, um, you know, that the Eokide are, uh, or however you pronounce it, are able to exist without divine interference. Um, they're able to be conductors for their own will. They don't conduct the will of gods. Um, but because they are resistant to magnetism or the pull or the, the wanting to be connected to other people or be connected to opposites or... Um, you know, whatever, they they tend to be very solitary. Um, and Elmer, in particular, is a full-blown serial killer. He uh, really does not give a shit about merchants, and he'd rather collect the bell bearings and turn them in than have to interact with a merchant. <laughs> and I found that, like, kind of cool that that's the way that they choose to um, kind of, like, characterize copper because copper is not magnetic and so therefore even though it's a great conductor it wouldn't be useful to balance an order of of uh concepts like if all of this if all these cyclones were copper they wouldn't be able to hold form the same way that gold and silver would does that make sense this problem with silver is that it dies too quickly it tarnishes too quickly so gold really seems to be the best option for gods to um, enact their will through, if that makes sense. So I'm going to get now into the crucible. And the crucible, um, so in real life, a crucible is a small ceramic or metal container which you can melt metals down into. And hey, we've been talking about metals and magnets this whole time. Um, so it's this container that holds it inside of itself. Um, and we actually have seen this kind of a crucible before in the Souls games. In the great, uh, in the uh, kiln of the first flame in Dark Souls 3, we see an eclipse in the background that is pouring into this, this kiln. And the kiln will bake, um, you know, uh, whatever you're pouring into it. Typically it's ceramic. I don't know why they would be pouring metal, um, but uh, yeah, it's interesting that, that Miyazaki's revisiting this this imagery of this uh, this crucible being like a kiln or like an area in which we bake or or melt or um, store our age. We like mix all these different ideologies and gods and we stick them together and we we consider that our new age, right? Um, and we see this in action. Um, Marika is inside the tree, which is the crucible, the earth tree. Um, and she is an Empyrean, which is a container um, for uh, the ring. And we, we kind of stick it together. So you can see this screenshot. I have the uh, Godwin rune, which is like the Duskborn rune inside of Marika. It's attached to the, the other rune. We also see the rune inside of Rad Radagon too. Um, but that being said, uh, I wanted to get into alchemy a little bit. Um, but there's actually this really great video done by Zeostorm that I want to link. Um, he gets into the the artistic inspiration for Elden Ring and how um, early alchemy and um, the language and mythology that was used to uh, describe alchemic practices, like early alchemic practices, is something that actually is like a very great 
source of inspiration for the the art directors and the artists of of Elden Ring. Would recommend the video. It's really great. Um, there's this uh, tree of alchemy that's going on here, um, and it's really interesting that we have these two trees. This is the great tree. This was the original um, tree. We call this the crucible. It was the original area where we would uh, converge different concepts and typically they were natural concepts. They were like birds and people and uh, trees and plant life and whatever and we would get things like misbegotten and these people were considered divine. Um, being a misbegotten wasn't considered a curse and then when Marika's age gradually progressed to the golden age after she married Radagon it was deemed accursed and um, there's an item called the root resin that talks about how the great tree itself, which is this guy right here, was disconnected from the Erd tree. So there was a person or a group or a point that decided that they were going to cut off the crucible from the Erd tree. And I do not know why and I do not know who, but um, that is very interesting. And the new crucible where we mix our metals together is inside this new tree, um, which is the Erd tree. That's Queen Marika's tree. Um, so I want to say too that this tree originally was would have been Godfrey and Godfrey's like crucible knights. I believe that this this system down here was supposed to be representative of like Godfrey's era or Godfrey's like early because he was kind of like that early Viking Nordic barbaric um, like aesthetic and they needed to they told <laughs> the great the greater world told him to put some pants on and they gave him Sirash to help quell his bloodlust. So he was definitely representative of this like tr this tree and hit during his age when he's married to Marika, the cru the um all the sigils that we see in the background of all of the early Erd tree incantations are these beautiful celtic knots that are like trees that are are symbolic of this like appreciation or worship of nature but then as soon as she marries radagon and we move um you know crucibles and we we kind of establish our foothold in landell a little bit more it's like the more modern we start to um see um al like kind of like alchemic symbols and we see triangles we see circles we stop seeing the worship of nature and we start seeing the worship of um alchemy as a in as opposed to that so this shift could kind of explain how marika is um kind of investigating and understanding the way that god's energy or god's like will can be trans uh transferred or conducted through the relationships between metal and the ways that we uh that mortals interact with this concept of of metal or faith or whatever um so that's kind of some food for thought for you guys uh definitely take a look into this i'm sure that there's people who are way more educated on this who are gonna uh, elaborate a bit more. I feel like it would be awesome to see if anyone could build off of this, so definitely feel free to tag me in any videos that you make. Um, I'd love to see it. So this is future Rachel coming back and editing this clip, and I totally realized that I kind of skimmed over Empyrean. Um, so the word itself stands for in on or in the fire. Um, so uh, you know, like if you are in a crucible, if you're in the fire, you'd be an Empyrean and you'd be holding the um, will of God like a container. But another thing too is Empyrean and Dante's Paradiso is uh, the layer of um, heaven. That's like the highest, highest layer of heaven. And it's the layer where God's will and man's will converge into one. Um, and it's also filled with a celestial fire that, um, you know, we keep seeing pop up. Uh, I believe that the celestial fire in this game is controlled and held by the fire giants on top of the mountains. So yeah, that's that. Totally forgot to put that in there because I was rambling. I was on a roll. But yeah. Ah. Something else that's really interesting to me is the primordial current. Um, it's something that the witches and like heretical scholars from Raya Lucaria are studying and it is the study of these like currents that flow through things um, and are really kind of like taboo to investigate. And um, a lot of scholars that decide to research this um, kind of go crazy with this like eldritch knowledge. But something that's super interesting is there's actually um, 
magnetic currents that are called convection currents, and it's all the heated metal under the Earth's crust that's constantly shifting due to this like heat. Um, and it actually allows early astrologers and travelers to use compasses to navigate through the Earth. Um, so it's very interesting that, you know, the scholars of Raya Lucaria, when they investigate this, that they want to become um, stars. And the reason why I think it's interesting that they want to become stars is because stars in this shape gives them the same magnetic poles, the North and the South Pole, and the magnetic field uh, that the Lands Between has, um, and that Queen Marika and the Glomide Queen have. So they're effectively turning into their own worlds, their own lands between. They're doing their own thing, but whether or not they're successful at it is up to debate. Um, I think the fact that they're still in the lands between and not out in outer space <laughs> is probably a sign of failure. Um, Selene also seems kind of miserable when you talk to her, but you know, maybe she succeeded. Maybe she's having a good time. We don't know. I also promised somebody that I was going to elaborate on the ripple because I was freaking out about it earlier, but there is something called gravitational waves or gravitational ripples. Um, and uh, I'll read a little bit about it, but Albert Einstein predicted the existence of them in 1916. Um, mathematics showed that massive accelerating objects such as neutron stars or black holes orbiting each other would disrupt space-time in a way uh, that waves undulating space-time would propagate in all directions away from the source. So like this. Um, and would travel at the speed of light. They would carry information with them about their origins, as well as clues to the nature of gravity itself. And this is really important because um, when the albinorics are born, they created a ripple through space. Um, and we start to see really interesting beings show up because of this ripple. I believe that the reason why Estelle ended up in Noxtella is because Estelle potentially... Estelle is a malformed star, so Estelle would have also created ripples. Um, it would be like... Estelle would be like a black hole. So I think that Estelle is drawn to these gravitational ripples in Noxella, which is why um, he ended up down there. I think that he was following the ripple. Um, and the Albinorics are, are born of this, or they, they create this when they're born. So they're like born of their own stars. They're born of their own, their own, their own damn thing. Um, I find all this stuff super, super cool. Uh, once again, I want to give a shout out to um, Zio uh, Storm, please watch their video. And then I also uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the Glomide Queen and Melina too, um, but I can do that another time. I'm definitely a Glomide Queen Melina. Like I think that Melina is the Glomide Queen. However, I don't think that she's Marika's daughter um, as it's established. She says she was born at the base of the earth tree, but um, when she talks about Bach, ba <laughs> She seems really confused about his relationship with his mother, um, and she seems to not even know what how a mother behaves or how being a child is like. So yeah, there's a whole thing regarding that. I'll I'll make I'll make some stuff. Sin did a really lovely post about Melina that I'll link below, um, and then I'll also link Hazel's account because Hazel has been supporting me through my uh, really cracked you know, 2 a.m. conspiracy theory uh, moments. So really thankful for everybody that's been a part of this and has been entertaining my my like wild train of thought. Um, yeah, feel free to link me any videos y'all make in response to this. Love to see it and have a good one. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>